Hey, Marketing Trends fans, this is Ben. Before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to let you know that we are going to be at Dreamforce in San Francisco this year. We're doing a few sessions, including a live recording on Tuesday, the 19th of November at the Pied Piper Bar in the Palace Hotel. So come say hi, we'd love to see you, and we hope to see you all there. I'm Alec Baldwin, and you're listening to Marketing Trends and the Leeds Art Week. Hello and welcome to Marketing Trends. This is producer Ben Wilson. Today's episode features an interview with Yasha Kekas wolf Yasha is the CMO of Mozilla, and he previously served as the CMO of BitTorrent and MindJet. In this interview, Yasha talks all about agile marketing, what it is, why he's such a big advocate of it, and how it can transform your marketing. Enjoy. Marketing Trends is created by the team at Mission.org and sponsored by Salesforce Pardot. B2B marketing automation on the world's number one CRM. Are you ready to take your B2B marketing to new heights? With Pardot, marketers can find and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click the link in the show notes. Here is your host, Ian Faison. Welcome to Marketing Trends. I'm Ian Faison, Chief Content Officer here at Mission.org. And we have in a studio, not our studio, but in a studio in downtown sunny San Francisco. Yasha, how's it going? It's going very well. And when you say studio, you really mean a tiny little closet. But I, I appreciate won't. it nonetheless. There's no clothes in here. Uh, we've recorded in actual closets before. So <laughs> this is it would be injustice to the studio to say we're in a closet. Well, that's incredibly kind of you. Really excited to talk to you today. We're going to do some agile stuff, which is exciting for us. We're going to talk a little open source. But first, how did you get into marketing in the first place? Uh, long kind of story, and I'd love to say that it was incredibly purposeful, but it wasn't. Um, I grew up in Oregon. Um, I was the oldest son of three boys, my mom who raised me and, and my brothers. She was an entrepreneur. And as an entrepreneur, she was a content promoter in particular, like I got a insight into all kinds of different things that I thought were interesting, but I really didn't have a center point of what I wanted to do. And so for me, uh, finding a path into school, being able to go to college, um, and then finding a practice study area that was interesting to me was like the first big hard point for me to figure out in my life what I really wanted to do. Um, and the reason that I chose to go to school where I did, which is in Los Angeles, was because I wanted to work in film and television. Like that was it, that was the thing that I cared about. And what I really struggled with when I left college, I ended up working for MTV as my first job, is that uh, the industry that I found myself in um, didn't operate the way that I wanted it to, like as an idealist. I was like, this doesn't make any sense. I work really hard. I'm a moderately smart person. And the problem that I kept seeing is that somebody who was somebody's brother or nephew or cousin would come in and get the job that I was trying to get. And I didn't get it. And I was super distraught. And so I, I kind of left that industry and I was working my way back up the West Coast, probably back to Oregon to do something similar to what I did growing up with my mom. And I stopped in San Jose, long story about how that happened. And I was with a couple of friends sleeping on the couch. And I read a story about a little technology company in the late nineties that was promising to organize all the stuff on the internet and their Yahoo. And it was just a couple hundred people at the time. And I sent kind of my diatribe of who I was as a person and what I thought was important. And uh, lo and behold, I got a call a couple of days later and I went in and I got an interview and got the job on the day and started in sales operations and then worked my way from sales operations into product and business development and ended up in effectively a product management role. And then I thought from that point in time, being in technology, being a product person, this is what I wanted to do forever. Flash forward uh, uh, several years later, I got recruited up to Seattle to work for Microsoft. Myself and a couple of my friends ended up pitching the idea for building a direct channel for Microsoft. So back in the time uh, in the late, late 90s, early aughts, Microsoft had been for 30 years selling their products through retail stores. Like you used to be able to go to a Best Buy and buy a box of software that you could install Windows on your computer for. And we said, hey, look, we think um, there's some important trends. One of those trends is that the internet's going to become more and more popular. The internet's going to give people broadband access. People are going to want to buy their software online and download it. That sounds silly to say what I'm saying it out loud now in <laughs> the year that it is. And uh, fundamentally, that means that as a company, we're going to have a direct relationship with customers. So we got fun Funded as a business, as a business idea, which is pretty cool for a young kid like me who had been a product person at the time for a few years. And I was the least technical of the technical co-founders on the team. And they kind of looked across the table and they're like, uh, you're going to do the marketing stuff. I was like, well, I don't know what that means, but okay, that's interesting. So I kind of found my way into marketing, I'm going to call it by accident, but mostly because I had a vision for a business opportunity and um, fell in love with it. 
almost immediately, like the practice of marketing. But I saw some pretty big challenges in the way that marketing teams work, which evolved into a new way to think about how marketing teams work, which has been a kind of a marker for my career over the years. But marketing for me was never an intentional path. Um, and I still kind of love being an outsider. Well, it's funny how you, you know, you can go back and connect the dots of I got, you know, film and television and, you know, MTV and these, all these different sort of things that all, you know, point to, hey, this could have been a marketing path, but it's like, I'm sure at the time it felt like a circuitous route. It really did. And it's, it's lovely to be able to look back and like make the storyline make sense to yeah. myself. And in the heat of the moment, I don't know that I connect them together as well as I could have. I, I can tell you that from a like a very personal perspective, my career in marketing really didn't take off until I started to develop a point of view of what I wanted to do. Like starting out in a business unit that was forming a, a big company like Microsoft and being responsible for marketing is an interesting way to be introduced into marketing, but it certainly isn't creating a point of view into how marketing can work. And it certainly isn't saying, I want to be a CMO. Yeah, totally. And, and for me, like really taking ownership of what I wanted to be effective as, as a marketer and what my goals were of ultimately running marketing organizations and helping businesses think about the way they work differently until I was able to do that, to articulate it, I really didn't have a career in marketing. So as much as I had this kind of winding path to get to where I started in marketing, once I found my way here, fell in love with it as a practice, created a plan for myself, I really didn't grow the career in the way that I have. You know, it's funny. So the, the very first guest we ever had on any mission podcast, Ellen Petrie Lenz said to us, you know, when you're young, you're trying to connect the dots, but you haven't placed all the dots yet. And yeah. it's like being young and going through your career is like trying to place dots in places where you have an impact on people, where you're making a good name for yourself or you're working hard and you're showing the people around you because all those people will come back into play years down the road. Yeah. And then once you look back, it's easy to connect it all. But it's like so many people are kind of, you know, worried about the destination, not about the journey. <laughs> it's really true. I, I, um, I am very fortunate that I get a chance to talk to a lot of new kind of entrants into the practice of marketing now. And my advice is always to think about what you do professionally, right? Like our jobs are, if we're in marketing, to help be very clear about the thing that we're responsible for is value like how it's going to change somebody's lives for the better for the most part or make things less expensive, right? And we do that for something that's abstract oftentimes, the products that we're working on, but we don't do it for ourselves. And there's a really important lesson in marketing and that's if you are clear in conviction in what you're trying to solve for, you can help your product be successful. And if you can apply that same thought process to yourself, you can be as successful professionally as you want to be. It is it is being purposeful about the path that you're on in the same way that you think about marketing. We're going to have this weird cobbler's child problem that exists <laughs> yeah, inside absolutely. of marketing in a bunch of different capacities. And, and personal growth, professional development is absolutely one of those cobbler's children's problems. Well, it's you spend uh, a lot of your time evangelizing to customers, but not like to the leadership team or the board or like right. showing why, you know, you're important or why your role is important or things like that. And we hear that all the time, both from CMOs that we talk to and also, you know, offline um, when they're kvetching about different things. Yeah. Um, but you do hear that a lot and it's, and, and you're spending a lot of your mental energy figuring out how to position your product or things like that, but not, not position not yourself. yourself. I use the word selfish a lot with people that I work with. And I think selfishness has a really negative connotation for a lot of the right reasons. But it is really, really important, especially as you're starting out in your career in marketing, to be selfish, to focus on yourself, to think about your value proposition in the workforce. And, and until you do that, until you be a little bit selfish, it's really hard to do anything other than accidentally be successful. Yeah, there is, there's a reason why, you know, I, I grew up in, in the military and there's a reason why your first job is just to yourself, yeah. right? It's like your job is to get your haircut correctly and to wear the uniform correctly and to lace your boots correctly and to like do everything for yourself. That's your only priority is you, is just doing what your job is supposed to be. And then once you become, you know, like a, a team leader and it's like you have uh, or a corporal or whatever it is, you have one report. It's like your job is to make that one person make sure all their stuff is correct and so on and so forth. And I think people a lot of times, and you see this with, with like titles on LinkedIn and all this sort of stuff, like everybody always wants to be something further 
along the line than they really are yeah. to, for this show of whatever it is or a show of impact, like head of blank or lead of blank or things like that. What and an awesome times, story, by the way. Like I have a lot of friends in the military and nobody's ever explained yeah. like their position in the military that way. Yeah. Well, it, so it ter turns out like this thing that's been around like, you know, 250 years is, has this structure that it's like, pardon the pun here, battle tested. But uh -huh. yeah, I mean, there's a reason. So like back in the day in the British military, I believe there was five ranks in between the queen to the lowest like private in the British military. And the American military is like patterned a lot of way out after that. But if you look at like the way that, and actually Steve Blank said this, who was in the Air Force and, um, yeah. you know, was obviously, you know, one of the godfathers of Silicon Valley. He was saying, if you look at how military units are, the size of military units, it actually patterns a startup really well. That's why like military veterans succeed in startups really well is because they've been in each of those size units. You have like the four person team and uh -huh. then you have, you know, a 10 person team and then you have a 40 person team and then you have a hundred person team. And so you kind of look at those things and it actually like each of those steps is a completely different sort of thing. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of parallels. I'm going to brush up my military strategy. Hey, really. um, so I know a guy. Uh, <laughs> And I wanted to bring you to the the culmination of your career, which is I'm sure you could have never figured out is becoming a podcaster because that, yeah. that's that's really what what you thought. So you have a podcast, which I admit I have not listened to yet, and I'm going to go check You're it out. You're going to love it as soon as you listen to it. I know. I'm really excited. <laughs> uh, I love all things, uh, all things Silicon Valley because I think it's a really special place. So I want to talk a little bit before we get into the podcasting piece about your current role as CMO yeah. Mozilla, what's what's going on here? What's the scope of your responsibilities? Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you that um, Mozilla was not the organization that I would have ever pictured myself at until I met the team at Mozilla. And now four and a half years in, I actually can't imagine a better fit for me. It's a pretty unique organization. A lot of people don't know this, but we're actually governed by a not-for-profit. And that uh, uniqueness as an organization provides us with the ability to make decisions that impact the mission that we have as an organization in a way that's not a farce, right? Like there's a, uh, before I talk a little bit about Mozilla, I'll just say it's like general commentary about Silicon Valley. I think that there is a, like a naivety that many of us go into in the organizations that we have the potential to work for. And that is kind of built behind a promise that many organizations have that they're going to try and change the world for the better. And, and there's a, a very big challenge to that promise. And that's that the economic system that most businesses work behind at some point force them to make a decision that's ultimately not about supporting the mission that they have that's trying to make the world a better place, but to make the profit better for the shareholders that they have. And I'm not an anti-capitalist, I want to be super clear, but I, I think that throughout my career, I really struggled with the idea that I wanted to be an idealist and I wanted to work on products that I loved and I want to work with people that were smart that I got to learn from. And invariably, I found myself in a situation where we were forced to make decisions that I don't think were intended to be better for the customers that we're building for. And I really struggle with it. So when I met Mozilla and I learned more about how we were structured, it was really intriguing and exciting. And I was introduced to Mozilla in a way that many of you probably have. There are four of us that are sitting in this little closet. If you've heard about Firefox recently or over the past couple of years, you probably said, I think I know of Firefox. I used to use Firefox. I don't really remember why I stopped using Firefox. And I think I know maybe that Firefox is built by Mozilla. And I think I know a little bit about Mozilla, but I generally think that they're good. I just don't know all the details around it. And I was kind of intrigued by this operational structure and then this kind of very ambiguous, but kind of moderately positive. Um, brand uh, kind of awareness around both what Firefox and Mozilla were. And as I started to learn more about what we work on, it really cemented for me the idea that this would be the place that would make me happiest and make me my best self as a professional. We as an organization, I think, do very important work. Uh, we believe that the internet as a resource should be a public resource and should be accessible to all people all over the world. Uh, there are a lot of threats to the internet right now. There have been a lot of threats to the internet since its inception, but right now we deal with a uh, particularly large threat that's coming from centralization behind big powers, whether it's governments or technologies or companies. We deal with a, a tremendous amount of misinformation that's being spread all over the world. And as an organization, we are constantly trying to find ways to put people back in charge of the internet to fight for decentralization where it's appropriate. And we do that in a really unique way. We have a, a set of policy that we push forward. Policy for a technology company generally takes one flavor. You promote the policies that support your products. And in our case, we promote the policies that support the internet being healthy. 
An example of that is that our team was the team that wrote the language that Chairman Wheeler's team used in the US here to reclassify the internet under Title II to protect it with net neutrality or to protect net neutrality. And we're also the group that's suing the SEC right now to repeal some of the rules that were taken away with the current administration. So we do policy work that kind of looks a little bit analogous to policy that you see at big technology companies. We just do it on behalf of the internet, not on our products. We build consumer products, and this is, gives us kind of our uniqueness in this space that have an enormous footprint. So Firefox as a product has 300 plus million people that use it each month and is growing in a lot of cases. And it has a, a huge global footprint, so it's not just in one particular area. That allows for us to create effectively constituency power so we can be more influential with our policy work. It also provides us with an economic engine to be able to support all of the work that we think is continued important or continuing to be important across the internet. And then we match that with educational work as well. And that shows up on our content strategies and marketing, but it also shows up in our on the ground work with our advocacy teams. So it's a really, really unique organization. And we are truly set up in a way that lets us make decisions that support the people that we build products for, not the work just contributing back to corporate shareholders, which is the way that most companies that have competitive products to ours work. The last four years have been awesome here. We've kind of reinvigorated the product. Our engineering teams and product teams have done an amazing job. If you use browsers, which most people do, and you want to be confident that you're using a browser that could have more information about you than probably the closest people in your lives. And you want to make sure you use a browser that's legitimately got your back and is going to try and protect your data from being weaponized by big technology companies. Firefox is the answer. And you don't have to make any trade-offs by choosing to use it versus a Chrome or a Safari. It's as good as, if not better in a lot of cases than it. So we've got this really beautiful product that does what it's intended to do, take care of people. And when you use our products, you help us support all of the other good work that we're doing as well. And that's a really unique model operationally. So I kind of love it here. I love what we get to do. And I love the position that we get to take in the world. You know, it's funny when I was thinking about this interview and, and kind of the prep for this and the idea of open source and kind of like what that means, the idea of, you know, like the internet as, as this resource that, you know, was created and shared. It kind of struck me like one of the things that, that we believe at, at Mission, why we're creating these this network of shows is like, there has to be a way for marketers to reach their customers that is not relying on, you know, like Google or Facebook exclusively, which is where, you know, the vast majority- Two biggest ad networks in the world, yeah. right? So it's like, you know, and what I think 80%, something like that. And like marketers need an avenue in which they can speak directly to groups of people. The idea of like branded content in general, and then like content in general and like ad supported content and all those sort of things is extremely nebulous anyways. But I think it kind of like goes down to this like idea of choice of like, what is the thing that's the best Absolutely. for you? Yeah. And uh, when the vast majority of marketers who are listening to this show know that you pretty much just have to earmark X amount of dollars for, you know, Google and Facebook every month, it's like clearly the marketers who are finding and exploiting in, in a good way, new channels yeah. are going to be the people who have success. Okay. I think choice is as important for businesses as it is for consumers. Right? When, when we as consumers walk into a store, if we choose to buy things that way, uh, and there is one option on the, you know, on the wall that we're choosing to buy from, it generally doesn't feel good. Maybe it gets the thing done that you want, but not having choice just physically doesn't feel good. When, uh, when we're a business and we've only got one or two options to be able to go help our business grow, to try and find new people that would be interested in the problems that we're trying to solve because they can make their lives better, like that doesn't feel good either. Mozilla as an organization, but me as a human being, um, we're all aligned around this idea that consumers ought to have choice and yeah. consumers and businesses also ought to have choice. And that's kind of where, where I was going with this is the fact that these new things will emerge, these new channels, these new opportunities, these new applications or, or in real life events or things like that, that will be created to kind of like counterbalance this sort of thing. And that stuff is exciting. Um, I get beat up all the time these days when I say IRL now. Um, I'm like, yeah, we, we'll meet up IRL. And they're like, that is discounting the fact that a big part of my life and identity is online. It's on Snap. It's on doing whatever I'm on. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I guess I'm showing my age now. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. And I actually want to talk about IRL. So I didn't know that IRL was... Also happens to be a podcast that we yeah, produce here. Podcast. Yeah, podcast. Yeah, so I didn't realize that that was you all. When you said that, it was like, it triggered in my brain. Um, and I'm like, 
wait a second, I didn't actually know that. So can you tell me the story of like how this all came about? Obviously yeah. we're passionate about podcasts, but yeah. I, this is, it's really cool because we were talking before the interview well, about this. Uh, a few years back, like p- part of what we have to do in marketing is figure out the different channels that we've got options to go into that we can introduce the stories that we think are important for people to know. And behind those stories, we can, when education happens, we can promote our products. So part of our theory for growth has been the more people that understand the ideas and the topic areas that are important for Mozilla, the more people are available to understand what Mozilla does, the more people that understand how unique Mozilla is as an organization, the higher uh, their purchase intent is, even though it's a free product for using Firefox. So we've had this kind of longstanding content strategy of let's help educate as many people in the target audiences that we care about as we can about the topics on the internet that are important. And then behind that, help show how Mozilla has a relationship into it. So IRL was kind of born from that strategy. And for us, trying to educate individuals that spend time on the internet about topics on the internet that are completely intangible is really difficult to do in hyper transactional modes. Like if it's a banner ad or a tiny little blog post or you know, pick whatever other short transactional method exists that we use in, in marketing. So we had a theory that longer form content would make sense for us. And the kind of journey of IRL has been first to kind of help educate listeners about the major topics on the internet, like decentralization and misinformation and a handful of others. And then over the course of the last few years, we've taken that kind of generation of listeners and begun to educate them more about the choices that they can make behind those topics if they're important to them. And then uh, we can gradually introduce Firefox as a brand behind that. But it's for us a very long lead strategy about educating people about the important topics on the internet and then making sure that Mozilla can have a relationship for them mentally. And then from there, helping them understand that there are products that are available for us. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that kind of was in the interlying piece there is that you built a show that was a hit that is something that people subscribe to yeah. that becomes part of their life because you have a product that you want people to subscribe to to become part of their life yeah. not subscribe in a traditional sense but subscribe in a habit forming sure. i want you to use this every day sense multiple times a day sense yeah. and i think that there's kind of this sense of marketing sometimes of like this disparate notion of like all these different campaigns that we're running that are you know sort of connected and interconnected, but not really. And like, we're trying to get to our 13 impressions equal sale and that sort of thing. Right. But making something great that people love that is part of their life is super important. Like, yeah. how, how did you think about that? We have a, a content business that's a part of Mozilla called Pocket. I don't know if you're familiar with Pocket. To, but you own, wait, Pocket like the- Pocket's a part of Mozilla, the Mozilla family. No kidding. So they've been with us for the last couple of years and kind of Pocket's mission, so a, a bit subservient to the Mozilla mission overall is to make sure that we help people find content that's worthy of their attention. I used to be a huge Pocket user. I, I, I don't know why I got off of it, but uh, that's crazy. So for us, the idea that you have to build something great first that can build a deeper relationship with somebody second, that can then in turn help the organization continue its mission third is a real logical path and and that's kind of the way that we try and approach everything here from building a product to building a podcast to building uh, you know video stories whatever it may be like we have to care about it being great first because when it's great it's got the best chance to build a deep relationship with somebody and yeah. when that happens then all of the other things that are the mechanics of the business can work that can help us support the mission that we care about which can then help us introduce ourselves to more people and build a relationship so it becomes this kind of virtuous cycle for us. I know we're not supposed to talk about ABM today, <laughs> uh, but we talk about this idea of like, whether whatever, you know, thing that you use for uh, ABM strategy, but like the E is engagement. Yeah. And like, that is the most loaded term in marketing right now. Uh, like, it's absolutely up there with them. And it, we're, we're a pure consumer go-to-market organization. So ABM as a concept doesn't really fit into our world. But the mechanics of B2B go-to-markets, like the, the the motions of B2B and the motions of consumer are actually really similar now. Agreed, yeah. Where they wouldn't, they weren't, I couldn't have said that several years ago. And they're really coming together conceptually because we've got the ability to understand if we're developing a relationship, to see the different engagement points, and to be able to collect both empirical and uh, subjective feedback feedback around whether or not the things that we're doing are meaningful. So the B2B world, I think, and the B2B go-to-markets generally have had this advantage of 
they can fill up the slack in kind of bad experiences because they've got expensive salespeople on customer success and other things that sit on top of a very refined set of people that they're going to market with. Consumer businesses really haven't had the ability to do that. And now I think we're seeing B2B go to markets try and have a beautiful customer experience like consumer companies are having and vice versa. We're starting to find ways to deepen relationships and expand networks and direct to consumer businesses as well. Well, and I, so I think it's hugely critical to be able to imagine the dichotomy of the marketer who is on one side, you have to make something that you will love, right? Like I got, there's great advice that I heard early on is like, if you're creating content and you don't love it, like probably nobody else. Is right. Doing, yeah. Right. But then you have the other side of that, which is like, as long as you're in the audience that is a part of the group that well, you're yeah. trying to sell to, right? Yeah. So the, yeah. yeah. So the assumption there is that you are in that audience, <laughs> right. that you're, that the tribe that you're building, you're a part of, yeah. which hopefully you are, um, yeah. uh, or at least you can empathize with. But the other piece of that is like, sometimes I feel like as marketers, we make something that we love and it isn't the case that like anybody else loves it. Yeah. How do you kind of look at those things, those two kind of, uh, those points as you're creating things? I think the underlying uh, takeaway here that I really believe is important is that part of our job in marketing inside of an organization is to help the organization have a taste maker, like a person in an organization who's responsible for finding the things that are worth people's attention and time. And, and that's going to look a little bit different for every kind of business. But if we're not proud of what we're doing, not just, hey, we got something done, but if we're not really excited and interested in it, it's going to be really difficult for other people to be interested and excited about it as well. Conversely, the things that we're most passionate and excited about oftentimes have the biggest potential impact for us, and they can show up in all kinds of different ways. I know we're recording, and I think these are evergreen for you generally, so we won't say too many dates, but I can tell you that at the time of the recording, there's an event that we're running in downtown San Francisco that we are incredibly proud of. Um, I am personally super proud of and excited about. It's an art exhibition. And kind of going back to some of the things we were talking about, part of what we have to do at Mozilla is educate consumers about the things that are going on online that they might want to care about. And one of the challenges that we have is that things on the internet are super intangible. So we partnered with about 50 different artists all over the world. And we are now in our third city that we've done this installation. We call it the Glass Room. It's a, a pop-up art exhibition that's kind of masquerading like a tech store. So the idea is consumers walk in and instead of being able to go up and buy an iPad off of a table, there are pieces of art that help you see how your information is being interacted with online. And the, the care and quality that has gone into the overall experience is really something that we get excited about, we care about, and we love to be a part of. And it shows with the consumers that walk in, they get just as excited as we are about it because it's such a, uh, like a beautiful experience and not beautiful in a, a superficial way, like thoughtful all the way through. So if you have the chance, um, you should walk around. Yeah, no kidding. 838 market uh, until it's about a week and a half more, it'll be running 12 to eight every day. And it's free hey. to the public. It's, I'm I'm heading to Second Street after this, yeah. so it's so right, on my, right on my route. Um, you get a sense of like what it means to be proud of the content that you develop and how that has a relationship both to us and the organization, but also for consumers. It's a really good physical manifestation of that. So I'm going to be the CEO here, and I'm going to say, how does that provide ROI? What's yeah. the ROI on this? The, the theory for growth for us is that uh, we can find a way to decrease cost per acquisition in the markets that we operate in when we introduce and improve specific attributes of our brands behind Firefox and Mozilla. So when we make an investment in an event like the glass room, or we run a brand campaign, which we do in many different countries around the world, what we're looking at is to find a strong enough change. And we do kind of very smart measurement around um, brand perception and specific brand understanding. When we see a big enough of a change in our brand specific attributes, we actually see a correlational relationship into a decrease in our cost per acquisition. So for us, it's about efficiency. We spend on the brand side, and when we spend on the brand side and it works the way that we need it to, which we can measure, um, then we see a decrease in our cost per acquisition. So that theory for us is what we're constantly trying to prove. If I go to our CEO or our board of directors or whoever I need to, to talk about an investment level that's substantial, like this is the theory that I have to be accountable for as the head of marketing and one that I'm comfortable being accountable for. But it, it took us a while to be able to develop the relationship between brand work attributes in our brand and our cost per acquisition work as well. We talk a lot on the show about marketing needs to be remarkable. I, I kind of, I think about this as like, 
you know, in the moment you always remember, like if you had an amazing meal, you're like, oh, that was an amazing meal. But like, you it really, you can't remember all the best meals of your life. Like yeah. it's, it's pretty hard to do that, but you do know your favorite restaurant yeah. or your, one of your favorite sure. restaurants, your favorite Thai restaurant. Catherine just went to my favorite Thai restaurant in Oakland recently. It's great, right? It was good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think like, you know, marketing kind of the same way where it needs to be remarkable, which means you need to remark about it to somebody else. You yeah. need to accelerate word of mouth. You need to tell a friend yeah. why you're using it and the problem that it's solving. Um, but you hit on something super important and, and the restaurant metaphor is awesome because the best restaurants aren't chaotic, right? They're not accidentally awesome. Yep. They're awesome because they have set up an operational structure that allows for them to create the best product, to be able to adjust the products when they're not the best products. Right? And then all of the creative flair from whoever the head chefs are or the pastry chefs, then things get to work in after the fact. And I think marketing has to be the exact same way. It is first and foremost about how do you create an organization that can run with like perfect efficiency, work well together front of house, back of house. And then how do you provide that as a platform to be able to do the best work, right? To do the things that are remarkable. Yeah, it's like, and you can't do a pop-up somewhere, you know, if you back of house hates your front of house, like we're That's never right. going to be able to take this on the road or do whatever it is or launch new items or be able to, you know, effectively communicate. This is actually, I'll send the analogy, um, shout out to Becky, because my girlfriend worked in restaurants for a while. And so at the most recent one she worked at, before she left the industry, they did what's called family meal. Have you ever heard of this? I know. So this is great. So at the beginning of the shift, all of the employees try every single dish, ah, yeah, right? And so every single person, so when they're serving, they know exactly like how it tastes on yeah. that day. Or no, family meals afterwards, lineup. That's what it's called. Lineup is before, family meals afterwards, all the extra- I'm gonna go food. start a restaurant after this. Yeah, I know, right? But so family meals afterwards, all the extra food that they then eat because like California laws are crazy and you can't give it away <laughs> and there's all these other crazy things. But lineup is the beginning of the meal um, where they all try what, what they eat. And I always thought this is like, and other restaurants like aren't like this. I'm like, what a brilliant idea. Like you think of the, the, the waiter that said to you, I haven't tried the Tuscany, whatever. And you're like, that kind of sucks. Yeah. Like, I'm kind of trusting They're you. Like, I'm not into that. Um, but there, there's something interesting about that model. I didn't know it was called that. I've, I've worked in the restaurant industry, especially young as I was growing up and I've certainly been around that. And um, what I always appreciated was this idea that there was a point in time before like the main shifts where the chefs came out. And the busters came out and everybody came out. It's kind of this cross-functional space where everybody's able to talk about the thing that was put together and what the story is behind it. And that's important. You know, this kind of restaurant metaphor, while it isn't perfectly adaptable into marketing, is somewhat related to the theory for marketing operations that I've developed over the course of the last 15 years. So back at that story at Microsoft, when I first started to work with marketing teams, with marketing experts, it was kind of fascinating for me because as a product D person at the time, I didn't really understand what they were doing. I was like... It seems like there's some really suboptimal processes, right? Like front of house and back of house aren't really working together particularly well. And at, like at its core, like for me, two big patterns started to emerge. One of those patterns is that inside of marketing organizations, and I think this is true in most marketing organizations, it's really hard to understand what the priorities are that impact yeah. the business, right? Like what's the quality product that's going to come out at all times? And that's kind of fascinating, right? Because it's Cobbler's Child. You ought to be, because you're in marketing, the highest functioning communicating organization in the entire business, but they just don't spend time generally to communicate what the priorities are. There's a knock-on effect for that. It's that most organizations outside of marketing, because the internal teams of marketing don't know what they're doing, what their priorities are. They have no idea outside. And so this tension starts to emerge almost immediately. If there isn't like a silo to silo inside of marketing friction, there's absolutely organization department friction. Kind of match that with this other thing that I started to see show up, and that's that, and I'm sure all of you can relate to this working in marketing, like marketing teams don't do cost estimates on work that they do in the same way that engineering product teams yeah. do. You're like, you, you go to your head of engineering and you're like, I, this is the user story we're trying to solve for. Here are the things that we care about that are the important features. And they go back with their team and they break down all the components and they come back and they say, it's going to take us 12 person months to get this thing put together. And here are all the different components and the cost for each one of them. And we can choose which ones we don't want, et cetera, et cetera. Conversely, like that same conversation happens with the head of marketing. It's like, 
like this release is happening two weeks from Thursday, get all the stuff done. Yep. And then the marketing team just kind of tries to figure it out. And the knock-on effect for that is that it becomes really difficult for marketing teams because they don't think about throughput consistently to actually be able to predict their impact of the business. So when I was at Microsoft, mostly because I didn't know any better and because I came from the product world, I started to apply lean and agile directly into marketing teams. Man, you jumped right on it. I was I was going to take you there. I, had, it was, I was lining <laughs> it up. I saw you going there and I'm like, I'm like this is... it's. it's You're it's, like restaurants. I don't understand front house back. But, but like the basic concept in agile, there are are like dogmatic kind of approaches to the way that people talk about and deploy agile. In my mind, it's super simple. Like what you were trying to do is two things. One, help an organization understand what its priorities are. You got a 50,000 foot strategy, make sure that the priorities that you have are directly related to it and make sure that those are transparently available to everybody. When that happens, the marketing team is generally working better and the organizations outside of marketing understand what the priorities are. So it seems kind of logical match that with the idea that you're starting to compartmentalize the work that you're doing in a certain amount of time. And even if we in marketing, other than our designers and our engineers, aren't familiar with the idea of predicting the amount of time that it takes to get something done, just purely by the act of committing work over a certain duration of time, two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is that you choose to do your sprints in, if you're using the system, you start to build that muscle memory. So over time, the marketing organization starts to become more effective at saying, all right, in order to get this much work done, these to solve these particular user stories, we know how many people hours it's going to take to get done. When you match those two things together with the way that the kind of operations work with Agile, you're fundamentally saying, I know my priorities, I know the biggest business problems I have to solve for, and I'm going to fund a team that has all of the experts across the organization that are best and most appropriate to solve that problem. We're going to bring that line cook out who made the beef. You're going to bring, you know, the uh, person who freshens the plate up at the end before it goes out to the runners. You're going to bring them all together because they're the experts that know how to describe exactly what's gone into that particular dish, right? And then you let them work together, right? And encourage them to work together and create a structure that supports them working together. And when you do that operationally as marketing, you can start to become a lot more accountable to where your resources are going, both your people, which are expensive costs, and your variable dollars, because you're constantly trying to solve the most important business problems, and you're doing it with the best people to do that in your work. So it, it kind of reminded me of the restaurant story that you were talking about. Like I think that marketing teams need to consider themselves more like that. When you build a structure that allows for great teamwork, and you start to think through how you always understand your priorities and how you always understand the throughput that you have, at that point, you can start to build remarkable work a lot more effectively. Like in my mind, the idea of agile instead of marketing um, is the only way for marketing to work. And as a operating system for marketing teams, it's going to be the only way that marketing teams work over the course of the next several years. Like there just isn't an option anymore. In the same way that software development doesn't do waterfall software development anymore. Yeah. So when I first learned about agile and sprints, I was one of the folks that was like, like the light turned on and I was, you know, like, huh, that seems like it should be the way things are done. And for the, for the marketers that are listening that might have had that same epiphany, but have not made the jump, that have not put the effort into it. What is your recommendation? And also I should say that you're involved with the Agile Marketing Meetup here in the Bay Area. This is uh, this is your bread and butter here that you know this I'm an stuff. old person in this practice, sure. uh, comparatively speaking. So. Um, so yeah, so there, there are a couple of things to think about. It's like, I appreciate the way that you said the light bulb went off. I, I kind of think about it the same way. It's a little bit like to beat this restaurant metaphor into the ground. It's like you're sitting at the table with your friends and your family and everybody's been served their plate and you're like, I'm starving. Where's my plate of food? And all you did was look around for where your food is. You just forgot to look down directly in front of you because your plate had already been set there. Yeah. Right. Like agile in my mind is just like that. Like the answer for how we work better, how we build better and more remarkable work in marketing was sitting directly in front of us. And it's literally just thinking about better communication and prioritization and thinking about throughput and then not being bound to our functional teams. Right. Well, I would I would add to that that the converse of this is that everybody at your table got all of their plates at different times and <laughs> your steak is super cold and everything else is <laughs> like, hot. Wait, no, this doesn't make any sense. Right? Because like, um, that's because that's what I feel like, you know, as marketers, that's what I feel like a lot of the times is the hurry up and wait, the like, oh, we have a product launch that we're going to put all this effort into. We're going to rush to this day. We're going to get everything out there. We launch the messaging. We have all the ad reads. We have everything good to go. And then you get the call from the GM that's like, our product isn't there yet. We can't have this messaging. Like we can't have, then you're like, 
what did we just How do? How did that happen? Yeah. No, you're totally right. But it, you know, to answer your question, like if, if somebody is listening to this and they're like, huh, I've heard people talk about Agile. I think I understood what it was, but maybe I should learn a little bit more. The encouragement that I would give is that you can be really selfish and you can think about Agile. Right, to go back to the earlier part of our conversation, what the system does for us as contributors into marketing that are working in a system like this is it allows for us to build our skill sets. If I know that what I want to do is run a marketing organization, one of the most important things I can do is to learn about how other functions within marketing work. One of the best opportunities to do that is to be in a team, a small team, we call them durable teams, that has cross-function in it right? So that I have the ability to expand my skill set. So I can grow those T-shaped skills that we talk about a lot in the corporate world. Agile as a system can be incredibly self-serving for a marketer who wants to learn about different things they can do to be more effective and more successful and grow their career. So yeah, all of the business benefits are there. But if you're interested, I would encourage you to think about Agile as a system that when you use it will actually help you be more marketable as a marketer. So what does that agile team look like? Like well, who's on that? Who's it, on the bus? It all depends on what the business problem is you're trying to solve for. Like in our world, we care about growth, like Mao for some of our products in different parts of the world. So we have to focus on growth because the business needs growth in Germany. I'm kind of making this up, but it's like semi related to the way that we work. What I'm going to do in my role in marketing is I'm going to find all of the different contributors that can help us get to growth inside of marketing for this particular product to see more people using the product each month. The way that we do that funding is that we'll say, in order to do that, we know that we need to be effective in acquisition marketing. So we'll take one of our demand gen experts. We know that we have to be effective in SEO. So we'll take one of our SEO experts. We know we need to create lots and lots of content. So maybe we'll put a writer and a designer on that team. And then we will uh, universally fund all of our teams with two additional roles in addition to the functional experts that are gonna go in. One of them is a scrum master. Mm -hmm. We call them a program manager in our world. It's a better career path than some of the skill sets in addition to scrum training are, are particularly important here for us, for our team. And then we put a team lead on, which in, in the product world, if you work in product, it's called the product lead. So our team lead is the person who owns the backlog. They're responsible for the business priorities. They're the ones that coordinate the work across the teams with the scrum master. So it's a form fit team. It's the best people we have in the organization to solve that one specific business problem. And our promise to that team is we're going to try and keep them together as a durable team for a minimum of six months. And if we do things well and we're planning well as an org, it's for a year. So you get these kind of different and unique experiences over a duration of time where you can build trust, right? Emotional safety amongst the team. And then you can do your best work because you learn how each other work together well. Are those teams, as you're building the durable teams, are you looking at specific one campaign, five campaigns, as many campaigns as it take? Like, is there a certain amount of, the, how do you look The at cadence and the things that the teams produce are at their discretion. So the team leads responsibility is to identify the strategy and the tactics that the team can work on together to hit the objective. And in the case that we were talking about before, if malgrowth in a specific country is the objective, there's a target attached to it. And to get from point A to point B, wherever that target is, the expectation is that team is going to be able to make the decisions on picking one big campaign, running five different campaigns, looking at uh, promotional opportunities, looking at co-marketing. They have the whole toolkit to be able to work with, and they have the authority and autonomy and support from the management team to be able to make decisions to run by themselves. What about those big budget, like always on campaigns? I know, I know you work, it seems like you work a lot on like nested priorities and like figuring out, you yeah. know, like your North Star metrics and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. But for something like IRL, which is, you know, potentially big, obviously huge expenditure in terms of like reach and, yeah. and, and volume and presence and eyeballs. And it's a sea level yeah. initiative, something like that. That's always on. Where does that fit into the larger strategy? S same thing. So if we have a desire to see brand improvement under specific attributes and specific parts of the world, um, one of the tactics the team can take on would be to build something like IRL. Um, we have epics that kind of layer over the narrative tools and the kind of reference to literary tools is very clear in the Agile world. So we use the concept of an epic to kind of wrap together all of the user stories that each of the teams are working on. So we'll lay out some priorities. Like we would like to, as an organization, do the following things over the course of the next year to benefit people in the following ways and specific markets. Some of the preferred tactics would be the following. We prefer to produce content. We prefer to produce audio content. I'm kind of making these up mm -hmm. as 
would go. Yeah. Um, but we do that so that we allow for the nesting to happen so that the team feels like they have permission to continue to make expenditures like IRL that are impacting the goals that they have in that particular market that they're operating in based on whatever the business priorities are. Yeah, one of the things that we've seen specifically with this type of like a large scale campaign like that content campaign where what's great is that different business units can can tap in to that asset or different teams or whatever right. it is. And that's like the brilliant thing about having a, a TV show or, or whatever it is. If you think of it like this thing that, hey, we have our conference coming up. Yeah. Let's promote it there. Let's like this asset that you can kind of flip different things into. Yeah. And then you get like who gets the resources and there's that right. sort of thing. But at least you can prioritize when you have some sort of always on campaign, that kind of drumbeat content that's going out that you have some control over, it's advantageous. When you build a product that's a hit, like IRL has been for us, you kind of generally just want to keep it alive and yeah. make it more successful as an org. What's been interesting is that as we've funded our durable teams and we've thought about our priorities, they have changed over the course of the last few mm -hmm. years. And IRL as a product has also changed a bit because of that. So as an example, when we first started building IRL, the team that was responsible for growing awareness and understanding of the Mozilla brand in North America was the team that came up with the concept and built it and had run it for a couple of years. And now the team that's responsible for brand awareness and understanding for Firefox is responsible for it. And so the same kind of frame and the same quality of the content is there, but some of its priorities, the topic that it cares about, um, are closer related into that particular brand. So that's, you know, that's why we talk about this is perfect for people that are trying to create and design a category because your category is your North Star of like this category we want to continue evangelizing. Yeah. And then you can run plays within that right. like nested priority. And yeah. it's like that stuff is so fun to me because then you can drop in all the different stuff you have. You can drop in webinars, you can drop in white papers, you can drop in like all sorts of different things when you have an engine going. That's right. And and we would say that I would say that the agile system allows for you to do that better than any other system. Totally, yeah. Because it is point. about nested priorities. And nested priorities are fundamentally about creating autonomy and ownership if you do it well, right? Like you can it clearly mess it up, but <laughs> we, right. we do an okay job. Well, we could quite literally keep going for hours. So before we get out of here, I want to do some lightning round questions. These questions are fast and easy, just like B2B marketing with Pardot. You can go to pardot.com slash podcast to learn more about B2B marketing. I've used Pardot before. Have you? I have. Oh, how was it? Uh, it was always a good experience for me. Um, I was an early buyer of, of oh, really? the kind of the whole world of marketing automation. So early Eloqua, yeah. use Pardot, Acton, like you name it. I've been around it. In fact, myself and uh, one of my colleagues uh, who is now a venture partner at our general partner at Upfront down in Los Angeles, Kobe Fuller, we did some research about two and a half, three years ago that looked at 3,700 different marketing tech companies and kind of evaluated their capabilities, got customer references, and then published it under a banner of the Growth First, which we ended up shutting down when we left to sell. But I was super, super deeply involved in the MarTech community, um, have been my entire career and absolutely no part out. So what's funny, so we interviewed Adam Blitzer and... Um fun fact, they grandfathered pricing for people that like Adam closed. So I, I don't know the exact number of accounts, but like they're still grandfathered accounts that That's he hilarious. closed that, you know, uh, I believe it. There's a, sometimes there's an advantage for being an old person in the industry. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. So everybody check out part out. We, you know that already fast and easy questions. Are you ready? Let's do it. Number one, what app on your phone is the most fun? Oh, the most fun. TikTok right now, but I'm a little bit, um, I have a little bit of an issue with it and then I'm, um, I've enjoyed it. I think that the way that they built the newsfeed is insane. Like it doesn't follow any model that I'm familiar with, but I still really like it. And then I am also really uncomfortable with their data practices generally. So I'm trying to figure out if there's a path for me to be able to enjoy the content that's on TikTok and not feel bad about using it. What is your favorite thing to cook or eat? Uh, I like desserts. Uh, and it kind of doesn't matter where they are. And I have a theory on why desserts are so good, right? Like in a kitchen, in a restaurant, as we were talking about before, this we're just going to beat the horse to death, <laughs> uh, right? Like you got, let's say there's 100 people in the kitchen, huge restaurant, 70 of them are going to be focused on the main courses and the appetizers. But there's going to be a little team that's going to focus just on your desserts. And not everybody in the restaurant orders desserts. Let's say 60% of the people don't order desserts. So you got 40% of the people that are going to get like 30% of the resources focused on just a great experience for them. So like if you get a chance for dessert at any restaurant, that's where the magic I think happens most of the time. My girlfriend was a former pastry chef, so I am well-versed. I have an advantage there in life. I'm doing but... super crappy on the lightning round, though. <laughs> oh, it's all right. <laughs> it's, light, it's lightning fast in yeah, our- in Lightning our, fast in question. Our, I got it, not yeah, answers. Questions, yeah. Um, other than 
This is your life in Silicon Valley and IRL. Do you have a favorite podcast? Um, I listen to so many. There's an episode of Good Food that I recent, uh, recently listened to at a recommendation from a friend that was, I think it's like four episodes ago. It was about the best tortilla in Los Angeles. Oh. And there's a competition that a food writer who used to be a writer down in Orange County um, runs each year. And it, like, I still think about it and I share it to all my friends. I don't necessarily listen to that podcast all the time, but that one episode was so like crazy insane. Every time I think about it, I just want to eat a flour tortilla. I love that stuff. That's so great. What is your favorite vacation spot? I'm pretty partial to anything that has a beach on it. So like if, if I get a chance to have downtime, which I really don't get a lot of downtime, we've got three kids and a busy job and uh, like a menagerie of animals at our house. Um, so we don't really get a lot of downtime. I want to do like a beach and I would love to say in, in like, it doesn't matter where I just want a beach. Favorite polo player of all time? Probably of all time. I'm kind of a more of a current fan of current sure. polo players. Um, this is a, could be a completely esoteric other channel that we take. Alberto Cambiasso is the best player in the world, but he's also the person who kind of made it acceptable to think about uh, genetic cloning in horses. And <laughs> oh um, ha not only is the best player in the world, but also has arguably the best string of ponies in the world. And they're all genetic clones, which I think is super fascinating. To have this like is, super old sport and this crazy new, like maybe ethically questionable, way groundbreaking technology that plays a role into it. I definitely you are our first polo or avid polo player on the show. <laughs> I'm, I try. I'm not very good, but I try. It's fun. Hidden talent or passion? Hmm. I think I'm a pretty good editor and it mm. doesn't matter the space that I'm in. Like I can be a good editor for writers. I can be a good editor for television shows, which I've worked on. Um, that's a very uh, kind of obscure talent that um, I love to get to pull out. And it's not something that I talk about all the time. Do you have a script sitting in your, uh, in your, in your office drawer that you're working on? Not that I'm working on, but I have a couple of scripts from friends of mine and colleagues that I'm helping them edit right now. If the world needs great editors. Final question. Second and final question. <laughs> Best <laughs> advice for a first-time CMO. So I think the, the problem that CMOs have right now, first or not, is that they are trying to do their job best and they are losing line of sight to the way that the business works. So first advice, best advice to first-time CMO is make sure you understand the dynamics of the business first, be the best business leader you can at the executive table, and be the depth expert in marketing. What question do you never get asked that you wish you were asked more often? If I could do any other job in the world and money weren't an issue or a thing that I cared about, what would I do? I never get asked that question. What would you do? I would be a coach. I would be like a baseball coach for high school kids. I love baseball. I don't love it to watch as much. I love to coach it. It makes me so happy. And all I want to do is get my kids to play baseball. None of them want to play baseball. And I don't want to just go coach a random kid and go to school <laughs> with them at the same time. But if I could do anything I wanted, I would love to be a high school baseball coach. Well, this has been awesome. Thanks for coming on the show. We appreciate it. We got to do this again because uh, this, is, this is a blast. And we're going we're gonna to do some fun podcast stuff in our new studio in San Francisco together. I can, I can feel it. It's on the horizon. I'm excited. Thank you guys for coming all the way to San Francisco into my little hovel of a closet slash recording room. Any final thoughts? Anything that's exciting coming up from Zilla? You know, if you have the chance and you're in San Francisco and, and you hear this and it's before the beginning of November, like absolutely head down to 838 Market and see the glass rooms 12 to 8 every day. Uh, until November 3rd, and it's free to the public. And if you need a new browser, I got a free one for you. I got the best browser for you. Firefox, right. absolutely. Awesome. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to this episode of Marketing Trends. Marketing Trends is created by the team at mission.org and sponsored by Salesforce Pardot. World-class marketers use Pardot to generate and nurture leads, close more deals, and maximize ROI at every stage of the sales cycle empower your marketing team to become revenue generating superheroes and let Pardot's data analysis keep an eye on the bottom line. Learn more by visiting pardot.com slash podcast or click on the link in the show notes.